Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. The HubSpot Podcast Network is the audio destination for business professionals who seek the best education and inspiration on how to start and grow a business. HubSpot Podcast Network hosts act as on-demand mentors to entrepreneurs, startups, and scale-ups through practical tips and inspirational stories. Listen, learn, and grow with the HubSpot Podcast Network at hubspot.com slash podcast network. Today, my guest is Arash Homampur. Arash is one of the most notable preeminent trial lawyers in the state of California, if not the entire United States of America. He is sought out by attorneys and clients to take on the most challenging but righteous cases. His firm exclusively represents plaintiffs in catastrophic injury and death cases. His firm has taken on the biggest and most formidable dependents, including Volkswagen, Lamborghini, Toyota, Nissan, Sunbeam, the state of California, Costco, Farmers Insurance Exchange, and Allstate. His firm specializes in what they call underdog or David versus Goliath litigation, where they represent individual clients that are taking on public entities, larger employers, industry, or manufacturer in an effort to change and or stop unlawful or unsafe conduct for the good of others and the community. In the last five years alone, Arash has obtained eight eight-figure verdicts, four seven-figure verdicts, in a wide array of trials involving dangerous products, roads, driving, and premises, including a record-setting 60 million wrongful death product liability verdict in Orange County and a 30 million wrongful death verdict in Ventura County. What we spoke about was David versus Goliath cases, how everyday citizens can take on giant companies and win. We spoke about how does he win these cases, the mindset and the strategy when other lawyers don't even take them on. We spoke about how he grew his law firm into an eight-figure firm by doubling down on a unique niche. We spoke about not letting his past dictate his value and to set your own value, how to be an outlier in your field and to lead the pack, as well as the importance of foundation. We walked through his entire origin story as well, which has led him to this point. This is Arash Homampur, an incredible, notable, preeminent trial attorney, one of the largest in the United States of America. I mean, basically, I think it starts with being the child of immigrant parents. That's a big, you know, common denominator in a lot of success stories is that you come to America with kind of no idea of how things are. There's no concept of rules. I was telling someone that, like, my rich friends, I grew up in West L.A., and we were very poor, but my rich friends, you know, in high school would go on ski vacations and go to fancy restaurants and, like, I never went on a ski vacation. I never went to a fancy restaurant. And so kind of my perception of what limits there are and what how life should work was kind of open-ended. So I think it gives you more opportunity to sort of grow and be even bigger than you ever could imagine. No, I, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a childhood of being poor, you know, with immigrants, knowing you're different just by appearance and by name. My name is R. Shamapur. I think being the weirdo today is considered a good thing. It's good to be unique and stand out and sort of make your own path and not live by how others live their life and trying not to look like other people, but just be yourself. And so I've always had that sort of approach. I was voted most unique and best eyes in in, uh, high school. And then, uh, you know, I went to USC. Back then, it was not hard to get into. Now it's a top 10 school. Back then, you went there when you couldn't get into UCLA. I had good grades, but they just weren't good enough for a state school. So I went to USC, kind of had no idea what I wanted to do, wasn't ready to enter the universe as a professional, decided to go to MBA or law school, said, well, law school seems more interesting based on the TV shows that were on back then, LA Law being one of them. And then I knew I could argue. In law school, I really had no idea. Most people in law school back then wanted to do like entertainment law and music law and something fancy. Uh, But I didn't have that opportunity because I just wasn't getting the grades and didn't get the sort of internships that would let you do that. So when I graduated, in fact, in law school, I did moot court, which is the equivalent of arguing. It's like a litigation program. The teacher said I sucked and that I should not do (laughs) litigation, that I wasn't good, ironically. I didn't really care what someone said. Um, So went to, you know, graduated law school. It was a great law school in terms of just teaching you the basics. But it wasn't like a law school that's going to get you the high paying job initially. You kind of have to do that on your own. I was at a seminar this weekend and I told people sometimes the best thing is that you don't graduate from the fancy school or college because that has a sort of path and course on its own that's kind of defined. Um, And whereas if you kind of graduate with nothing, 
there are no limits. You can kind of, kind of, you have the hunger and desire to really prove yourself. So that's who I was in law school. Really had no job, no mentor, no cases, and just basically worked my way to where I am today, one case at a time, with a passion and love affair for what I do, working harder than anybody else, confidence in, my, in myself, and then also the key to it is developing who I am as a human outside of who I be as a lawyer. Because you learn how to be a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or whatever, a marketing person. You can learn those trades by reading and studying and going to school and then doing it in real life. But really, I think what sets you apart in all of those areas is you being the best human you can possibly be. Being evolved, like the Deepak Chopra or what, or, you know, whatever, Wim Hof or whatever of humanity. Then when you enter into those professional worlds, you kind of transcend the profession and you sort of become an outlier that stands out. You're, so you're starting me, off esoterical. You're, I love it, but you're starting off. You're starting off very high level. But it, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just I wanted to I wanted good. to understand. Is that where is that when you hit the ground running out of law school? Did you have that mindset? Because many people don't have that mindset going coming out of I law did. school. Yeah, very I had good. my best friend, best friend, like she says, do something. I do it in law school said. There's a program called Landmark Education. It's worldwide. Do it. There's a program called Intro to the Forum. And basically, it's a, a self-development program live with 500 people where through experiential learning and sharing, you learn about how humans are. You learn kind of the roadmap to human behavior. And rather than living your life where you're uh, unaware and reacting to everything as a mortal human, it gives you a bird's eye view of who it is to be human so that you're less reactive, you're more in control, you have integrity, and you do what you say you're gonna do and actually accomplish it. So that was essential, doing landmark education. There's a lot of programs like that. I highly recommend that one because it's structured and they use it with CEOs and regular ordinary people and it's effective in terms of breaking through uh, with your own life and breaking through as a professional or in relationships. So that was the one key thing I did that kind of gave me you know, super, superpowers and wings mm -hmm. that other people didn't have. So, okay, so now you're finished law school, you're going out, you're just, you're grinding, but you, you're doing it with a sense of purpose. Like this is, this is not the traditional, like first year out of law school type mentality. So I, I appreciate that. And what, is that purpose what directed you down the path of personal injury? Which it's interesting to hear you say why you, why you had, or what you had, you know, this lens that you saw life through coming out of university or college, just because personal injury seems to be like the law that everybody seems to be going. I see the billboards. I see the radio. Ad. It's all personal injury, personal injury, but it doesn't seem to be through the lens that you're looking at it through. Right. Well, personal injury on billboards, that's a business. They're basically signing up cases and looking at the practice of law as a business. How can I make as much money as possible? In, uh, in each individual case on a mass scale. There's nothing wrong with that per se. I, I'm not a business, I'm a lawyer by profession. I was put on this earth to identify and hold wrongdoers accountable and make them pay for what they did and make the world a safer space on a large scale. I take on the biggest of big. It literally is David versus Goliath. The larger you are, the hungrier I am, the more evil your wrongdoing is, the bigger negative impact you have, the harder I'm coming after you, and I'm going to hold you accountable. So what I do is really a profession. It's not a business. I don't look at anything like how much money can I make and et cetera. It's really just how much of an impact can I make? How much can I transform someone who's been hurt their life and uh, hold someone that's done something wrong accountable? So it's two different amazing. things, but there's space for both. Of course. No, it's amazing. So, um, it's like Led Zeppelin versus Britney Spears. You know, the, <laughs> hey, we all love a good pop song, but at yeah. the end of the day, is that is that enough nourishment for a true music lover? No. You they know, want more. Like, they want to go deeper. Yeah. Like a Twinkie. Yeah. But I also want to eat some premium Toro. So you need the Led Zeppelin or whatever, <laughs> you know, sophisticated band there is out there that floats your boat. So you you went into law, you decided to go into personal injury law immediately. Is that the is that 
what you knew that you wanted to do right out of uh, college? I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, Posty. Now, it's no lie that in the competitive world of marketing, advertisers, marketers are trying to find a way to better connect and get in front of their audience. I've been trying to figure that out my entire career. You want to accelerate the growth of your company and you want to reach new customers with measurable results. But most of the existing channels are oversaturated. There's so much noise out there. So the best marketers are turning to direct mail, but wait for it direct mail reinvented. One of the best kept secrets in marketing is that direct mail gets close to 100% open rate and is one of the most impactful ways to market a product or service, but it's expensive and it's cumbersome. Posty is transforming direct mail. They're adding all the digital marketing capabilities, tracking, KPIs, analytics that you would normally see in Google, Facebook, or YouTube paid campaigns. They're adding that to direct mail. Basically, Posty allows you to set up direct mail campaigns like a digital marketer. So it's a one-stop shop for building audiences, setting up campaigns with A-B tests, approving creative, tracking results in real time. It also integrates into your CRM, which allows you to build lookalike models from over 250 million US customers. You also have just as many targeting options as Facebook or as Google. And on top of all of this, it's fully automated. So you are operating all these campaigns from a web browser, from your laptop, and Posty takes care of all the printing and logistics and the mailing so that you are just pressing go. It's like direct mail with an easy button. Posty Campaigns allows you to attract new customers, retarget your website visitors and track conversions, re-engage your existing customers and increase their total lifetime value. For anyone that is looking to start, grow, scale a business, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the Success Story podcast audience. This can really elevate your marketing if you start using direct mail day one and Posty makes it really easy. It will make you stand out as a company. When you get a piece of mail, no one else is doing that. So if you want to get your free Posty Posty demo. They've set up a special link. So go to posty.com slash success story. That is posty.com slash success story. They'll give you a free demo because Posty is direct mail reinvented for the digital world and the people that use something different, something that makes them stand out to market to their customers will be the people who win. And direct mail definitely has that edge. All right, let's get back to the show. Well, I saw that the space in which I could make the biggest impact where there yeah. wasn't really a sort of five star five dining approach was in personal injury. In other words, what you're describing with the marketing and the billboards, that's basically Carl's Jr., you know, fast yeah. food legal services. But when you are involved in personal injury that involves a company selling a dangerous product or a dangerous medicine or a roadway that is dangerous that should be fixed large scale wrongdoing Mm -hmm. or uh, unreasonable conduct that requires five-star dining because before you open that restaurant and you serve a seven thousand dollar meal or five hundred dollar meal or whatever you need expensive plates you need high-end chefs you need thought you need the uh, you know how it looks how it tastes how it feels thought out you need artists making food that stands out that someone's willing to pay that kind of money for that's what we that's what i'm gravitate to that's what i wanted to do and that's what i build my career up doing you know started with the small mcdonald's you know transactions mm-hmm. worked up to medium dining two star dining three star dining and now we are you know the preeminent five star your michelin nothing. star your michelin your michelin star at this point we are yeah Amazing. Uh, by the way, I appreciate the the analogies. <laughs> I'm trying to make it simple for everyone to understand. Brittany and food, you know. Uh, everybody can get that. Um, yeah. Everybody can get behind that. Okay, so walk me through some of these wins that you've had over your career. And because and, some of these stories, I'm sure, whatever you're able to talk about, of course. I can talk about anything. Well, All right. my, I mean, you know, I started trying cases, meaning going into a courtroom, getting in front of a judge or a jury immediately. Because I was literally the guy that's like, I'm Kobe Bryant. You don't know it. Give me the ball. Get out of my way. And I would basically get a small ball, like a racket ball. I get to throw it. Then I get a tennis ball. And then someone gives you a volleyball. And then finally someone gives me a basketball of prime time on the court. And I dunk it times 10. You know what I mean? That's my sort of the way I, I looked at things. So basically what I did is I would take on any tough case that had a big upside because mm-hmm. those are the cases they won't settle. In fact, all of my big wins are in the context of a defendant 
that not only underestimated, but probably insulted me by offering zero to settle or offering some nominal sum to resolve that lawsuit before a jury decided, all of which gives me the opportunity to take a big righteous case all the way, try it and get the maximum result from jurors rather than resolving it uh, with a defendant paying what they think is reasonable. So my first big case was uh, we were suing the city of Fontana for not having sidewalks in an area that they knew children were walking to and from school sharing the road with vehicles. And so the city knew, they didn't know when it was going to happen, but they knew based on internal documents uh, that at one point a child was going to get hit by a car because there was no safe place for the child to walk. And rather than spending, they had millions, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars in undesignated funds available to be used to fix the road, which would have cost about $30,000. They were not using their own money and trying to get the state to fund their own financial obligation. And so it was a very tough case in that a 15-year-old, unlicensed, uninsured, um, undocumented child was driving a car, trying to pass someone, got angry, went around and hit a young girl, killing her, 13-year-old Karen Medina. And in that case, the interesting thing was the city thought the case was so dumb because of the facts and because this, they thought this girl had no value. Literally, this is an ironic thing for if any attorney knows who I'm about to talk about. The, the adjuster, they have insurance companies that adjust claims against big cities. He called me and he's like, this was at the beginning of my career. He goes, you know, you're, you're okay, but you're no Tom Girardi. Tom Girardi being the attorney who we now know stole millions of funds or allegedly stole millions of funds from his clients and fell from, you know, from being one of the, considered one of the top attorneys to one of the biggest losers ever. And then he also said the adjuster from the insurance company said, and your client was just some Hispanic girl. What do you think a jury is going to award her? And I mean, when he said those two things, it was literally as if like God put a lightning rod inside of me and said, we're going to show you what's going to happen. So they offered zero to settle that case. And I got $38 million for a wrongful death case, which if you talk to any attorney is like not, not a number in the stratosphere. It's like outside the realm of logic in terms of how much money that is for an unknown attorney to get in the context of that difficult liability with the, those damages, it's unheard of. And what I was doing is, it wasn't like, you know, you like you, your bands have one hit wonders. They'll have one song, it's like all gels and that's it. I wasn't a one hit wonder. Literally every single year after that verdict, I was hitting huge verdicts, sometimes four in a year of seven to eight figure verdicts, meaning, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 50 million, 60 million verdicts in cases other attorneys not only would they not touch, but could not win, let alone win at the levels that I was getting. So I started the ground running and then literally just kept running, 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 winning. Why, why is that? Why? First, two questions on that point. Yeah. Why do other attorneys not take them on? Why are some of these cases so difficult to win? What's, what's well, your differentiator in, well, in how I you handle it? I tell people, if I walk into a courtroom, it's me against a defense attorney or attorneys. Many times we have multiple law firms against us. And I'm not saying this to brag or, or boast or anything because I really don't like operating from ego, but I am an evolved human on another level, right? I am kind, loving, generous. I know my, uh, my uh, failures. I embrace my weaknesses. I embrace my tendency to be ego oriented. I'm always trying to kill the ego. I'm always trying to come from love and kindness. I have talent. And when you take someone evolved and put them in a courtroom next to your typical defense attorney, which is, you know, typically an older white male or an older, um, you know, unaware person, mm -hmm. uh, they tend not to do as well because they're not evolved. They're unidimensional. They're angry. They drink the Kool-Aid that everyone's a fraud and a fake. They tend to use artifice or trickery or deceit to win their cases. Hiring the same experts who come in and tell a bunch of lies to jurors or try and confuse jurors. And so when you've got a, a defense with its bag of tricks, it's deceptive, it's not good, it's mean, it's evil, and you've got an evolved person who not only can, can convince the jury of what's righteous, but can un unravel and reveal the lies and deception of the defense, it's no match. The only time I lose is if I deserve to lose because the facts justify a juror finding 
against me. Other than that, it's no competition, if that makes sense. And that, that applies to any space that it you're does. doing, anywhere, any profession. If you are an evolved, good, fundamentally good human, you are, and, and you love what you do, and you're passionate about what you do, you will do infinitely better than your competition. Very, very well said. Very, very well said. So as your career evolves, now you're hitting home runs again and again and again. Um, what, is your, what, is your current, what is your current focus in your career? Because I feel like you have many of these stories, but just at a high level, sure. what does your career progress to now? Well, I always wanted to create a firm where I didn't have to do everything, where my talents and efforts can be more focused on the biggest possible result. So right now I'm doing cases worth, let's say, 20 to 60 million. I'm trying to transition to doing cases worth 100 million to a billion, not because I want more money, because I'm not about consumption, simply because I want to generate as much money from this wrongdoing as possible to give back and make a difference in the universe. Like I set up a foundation of my, you know, where I funded it with a million dollars of my own money to help other people get to the next level in their life through micro grants to individuals that deserve it. You know, you see these attorneys and firms, they do these thousand dollar scholarships and, and like more power to you, but come on, what's a thousand dollar scholarship in the context of the marketing budget, we know these businesses are spending on internet advertising. It's mm -hmm. nothing. It's a joke. It's actually offensive because that thousand dollars isn't going to do anything. We know clearly you're using it for marketing. Again, I want people to do these scholarships, but a thousand dollars is not going to cut it. So for me, I'm putting my, my money where my mouth is. I've been given this opportunity and like sort of luck. luck of yeah. making a lot of money doing something I love. And for me, if I use it to buy a bunch of garbage for myself and things, that's disgusting. If my existence is to consume, buy more Ferraris or whatever, I don't have any Ferraris by the way, that's lame. I wanna use the money to make the biggest impact and help other people. I was, we were talking about this this weekend. There are so many Elon Musks and um, you know other females and persons of color who have potential that never get that potential because A, no one told them they can do it. B, there's no environment conducive that fosters that thinking. They don't have the resources. They just don't have the, the ability to get there. And so rather than teaching kids you know, math and geometry only, I want to start teaching kids at an early level at an early age, they can do whatever they want to do. Literally, like if you're in an auditorium, we're thinking about doing this, and there's a kid who, whose shoes aren't as cool as the other person, who's not as popular as the you know homecoming person. Go, look at you. You're the one that's going to be successful. You're the one that's not going to flame out in high school where your heyday is I was the prom king or queen. You're the one that's going to be the weirdo that makes a difference in this universe. But they don't know it many times and we don't get the benefit of it because there's no sort of structure set up to help those kids. So what's my purpose? Bigger and bigger cases, more money, start, start donating uh, more and making a bigger impact in the universe and helping other people achieve the success, if not more than I have in my life. Beautiful. Um, I, want to, I want to bring out some, uh, some ideas on, I guess, on personal development that I, I can hear that you get very passionate about. But I just want to, I, I still want to get a little bit more of the, the tangible legal insight out of your brain before we, we go into other stuff. So I think that the most, you know, the, the, the most important question would be when people take on these companies, what, what, what do they even hope to achieve? How can they take these companies on and win? I guess hire well, you, but outside outside of that. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. HubSpot is the CRM platform that is easy to implement and is even easier to get your team to adopt. And ask anybody that's implemented new technology in a company, the biggest issue is not finding it or buying it. It's getting your team and your company to actually use it and adopt it. And when it's a piece like a CRM, one of the most critical pieces of your business infrastructure and your tech stack, if people don't adopt it and use it, that means you're getting incomplete data, you're getting missing data, you're getting garbage data, it could impact 
quite literally everybody in your company, as well as it could negatively impact your customers and your revenue. So how does HubSpot solve for this with their CRM platform? There's two components that they focus on that allow for organizational wide adoption. This is the contact timeline, as well as the mobile app. So the contact timeline gives a historical context for all of the data that is associated with a certain contact in the CRM. That means that anybody across the organization can see all the actions and all the interactions that have taken place against that particular contact. You can also use that timeline to make calls to these contacts, enroll them in sequences, put them into marketing or sales campaigns, schedule a meeting, open tickets. The historical timeline makes it easy to take action as well as to track the action that's been taken against all of your contacts. And it's not a pain to enter the information, which means that it doesn't take somebody a long time to put in great data, which can again positively impact your whole company. The second piece is the access from anywhere, meaning if I have a phone and I'm on the road, the world's opening up a little bit more now, people are traveling again, I can use the HubSpot app to access my CRM anywhere, on the go, on the fly, doesn't matter. So I have complete access to the CRM, I have access to my spreadsheets, my calendars, my notebooks, all of my contacts. I can send messages across my team with the HubSpot keyboard. I can access my contacts, call them through the HubSpot app. I can take quick notes, I can take contact information, I can all log it into my HubSpot app so that I can pull it up later on my desktop when I'm back at home. It's simple, it's in intuitive. It's meant to make it easy, frictionless, so that your team sees the value in properly using the CRM to the fullest of its capabilities and gives them the tools and the tech to allow them to do it without spending too much time and causing them more headache. The best thing about HubSpot is that it can be set up for any size of business and it will scale with you. If you're just starting out, you can take advantage of certain features and then as you scale your business, you'll notice that HubSpot will support almost anything you need as you grow. So if you do want to learn how to scale your business without scaling complexity, go to HubSpot.com. No, no. So it's, you know, the David versus Goliath sort of um, fr frame is interesting because today a 17-year-old kid can make a hit song on his laptop with three pieces of software, okay? A... 15 year old kid can make money in cryptocurrency, right? <laughs> on a level that the traditional bank could never make. So there is an efficiency that exists today through the harnessing of technology, through using new techniques, through being you know, a good person that will allow you to transcend and annihilate the biggest corporation because they just don't have the, um, the ability to navigate through things as easily with the best results as let's say someone who's more nimble and more Agreed. aware Agreed. And, more and so yeah. harnessing that allows you to take on toyota because toyota's got 50 attorneys right when there's 50 attorneys on the other side i'm gonna win if i deserve to win because you can't compare one person who knows everything who's evolved to 50 people that are like too many cooks in the kitchen you know what i mean yeah. literally that's how we take advantage we can spend just as much money as they spend in doing testing and working up a case. Uh, they can't outspend us because many times these defendants will spend money inefficiently on dumb stuff. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we take on a big products defendant and they spend a million bucks doing something that ultimately isn't even admissible because I know what is and isn't admissible. I know what games they are playing with the stuff that they're doing. So how do you take on big corporations? You appreciate the strength you have in who you are in 2021. Um, the world is now moving away from the old paradigm and the old structures and the old narratives and is way more receptive to the new narratives of you know, inclusiveness, of, of, of loving everybody, of letting people define what their happiness is, of not believing this baloney structure that the only thing that's good looking is, is you know, white. Uh, yeah. There's space for everyone to shine. You know, it's a different world. So I think in any profession, it's easier to distinguish yourself and sort of be an outlier uh, than it was ever before. And I guess my, because these themes are, they're, they're so right on, but why, why are you so passionate about these things? Besides the fact that it's just good to be passionate about 
being good and being a better person. But I speak to, you know, just I speak to a lot of people and I'm sure that they are good people, but they aren't as passionate about the things that you're speaking about. They don't bring them up in discussion. What, what, what was the cause or the trigger? Well, I mean, look, anytime you define happiness by yourself, by what you get for yourself, you're never going to be happy. You, happiness is when you're of service to others. When the circle of, of what makes you happy is larger and you're of service, meaning that like love is not about getting, it's giving. Happiness is not about getting, it's giving. When, you, when that clicks in your brain, then you realize the more joy you're going to get in your life by the more people you help. I literally have this sort of analogy of I'm a candle and my job is to light as many candles in this universe as I possibly can. No strings attached, no expectation. I don't get anything other than make the world a better place. If I can inspire someone to get to the next level and be happier, you know, that's infectious. It helps the universe. It helps uh, my children live in a world that when I die, they want to live in. And it, it really makes an impact longer than, uh, your, you know, your limited number of years on, on this earth. I mean, that's one thing about music. I talk to people about, about this. You know, someone wrote a song in 1960. They're dead. They sat in a studio with a drummer and a guitar player and, and a bass player, Jimi Hendrix, and they just jam. And that little six-minute jam has brought so much joy. And like millions and millions of times, people listen to that and it gets them through hard times or it pumps them up before their workout or it pumps them up before a board meeting or whatever, right? That's the power of music. That's the power of what it is to be human. And so that's kind of transitioning to why I love music so much is because it just has so much power, transcendental power beyond the six minutes it takes to make something. I want to, I also want to, like, I want to unpack some lessons that you've, that you sort of live some of the values, but also let's talk about your firm because I was listening to, I was listening to another show and you speak a lot about how you run your firm and how you want to reinvest in the people in your firm and how you want them to have balance. All these concepts come from this like the best way I can describe it is like a mindset of abundance. And that's not where I expected this podcast to go at all, but that's where, you know, that's like your core theme. If I could sort of pin it on one thing, yeah. it's like giving, giving. So walk me even through some of the lessons uh, that you've discovered in your firm, because I think that's a smart leadership, smart management style that you've it's sort of incorporated. Manners. You know, it's shocking how many people don't have manners. If you go to someone's house, clean up after yourself. If you go to someone's house, respect the people around there. If you go and meet someone new, don't be small and go, I don't matter. Say hello, be polite, hi, thank you, manners. And, and you take those basic lessons at home and you put it everywhere you go. When the busboy talks to you, you look them in the eye. When the valet looks at you, you talk to them. When you're in an elevator and someone strikes up a conversation, say hello. Same with your staff at, at work, treat them like family. Treat them like you would treat them like you would treat yourself or any other member of your family. The, it, the world doesn't exist for you to exploit and game them or it. The world <laughs> exists for you to take care of other people, treat people with joy and love. And the, the outcome of that, the outflow and what comes back to you is good vibes, good mm -hmm. karma, positivity, synchronicities. I have synchronicities in my life that are like mind blowing in terms of I think of something, I want something to happen. Someone comes along and like I cut, you know, six months ahead in terms of doing something. Why? Because I'm a kind, loving person. I put good vibes out there. I treat people with respect. I tend to, oh, I tend to actually treat people nicer. If you look at how, what, how I treat people nicer than you would expect. I should or would, but I do it because that's the way I was raised. That's what works. And that's how yeah. all people should be. So same with employees. I just believe in work-life balance, not overworking them. I never yell. I'm never disrespectful. I tolerate mistakes because that's part of being human. Um, you know, we have good employees who have been with us a long time. And if you come to my office, you'll see they work because they love to work. They want to make a difference. It's not a job for them. It really is a place where they want to be. The office looks nicer than most fancy hotels. The office provides food and drink, like fancy tea, fancy water, whatever they want to eat. I pay for those things. If they want to take self-help course, I pay for it. If they want to take yoga, I pay for it. Why? The more well-rounded and happier they are as a human, the better their productivity at work. It's like win-win, no-brainer stuff that so many people don't understand. They're misers 
when it comes to taking care of their employees and they don't understand they're shortchanging their their potential. I was going to say, like, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head, like when it comes to when it comes to reinvesting in your own people. And I, I was just hearing about when you did an interview on work life balance and stopping your people from working on the weekends or whatnot. But if you actually look at the if you do look if you run a cost benefit analysis of investing in your people versus even hiring and staff turnover and whatnot, there's some numbers there that you really have to consider. But you know, you you also said it correctly. I, I I'm in alignment with everything you're saying, but many people just miss the mark. Many leaders, many managers, many CEOs found they just miss the mark, um, which is unfortunate. Um, a few other a few other points that I thought were interesting. One of the themes that I was prepping, when I was prepping this interview, uh, one of the themes that I brought out was not letting your past uh, dictate your value and setting your own value. Speak to me about that. It's really simple. Your past is your past. You have no control over it. So whether you did phenomenal or you did poorly, it's irrelevant. Who you be is who you declare you're going to be. If I walk into a room and I think I'm hot shit because I won a $20 million verdict, I'm not going to relate to anyone. They're going to go, this guy's an idiot, a moron. Like, he thinks he's hot shit. If I walk in a room and go, well, I'm a loser because I lost four trials, again, that's not relatable. What matters is who do I declare I'm going to be in this moment, in this transaction, with this human being? If I declare I'm going to be loving, kind, generous, be it. Now, do we fail? Are we sometimes jerks? Are we sometimes ego-based? Yes. Clean it up. If you do something that, that like, you go, ugh, why did I do that? Clean it up with the person. Forgive yourself. You're human. Everyone's done it. But don't let your past, whether positive or negative, dictate who you be. Who you be is who you declare yourself to be. That's it. And I think that that's a smart, that's a smart entrepreneurial lesson as well, because I think that if you are going to embark on anything, like even you said, you had a, a, a not so easy go about the first, you know, the the first part of your education and your and your life, you were not raised into money or anything like that. And you set that standard yourself and you sort of carried it forward. And that's something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs have to deal with because they're going to have multiple failures and repeat failures. And it's normal and it's common. And actually hitting a home run that soon is actually uncommon. I, I, you know, I know a lot of people that have gone seven, eight, nine, ten years before they hit that proverbial home run. Um, another theme that I thought was interesting how to be an outlier in your field. So how do you differentiate yourself? You sort of touched on it, but you're in a crowded field. There's, there's the, you know, the Carl's Jr. Um, uh, injury and personal injury attorneys. How do you differentiate yourself besides okay. attitude? Right. I so guess that's part of it. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, Quantum Metric. So what Quantum Metric is going to do is it's going to allow you to develop a single source of customer centric truth that can help you understand how to position your products, how to sell to your customers, because anyone is a digital leader who wants to understand your customers better. It should be 100% of you. You should want to understand the customer experience when they hit your website. And then you also want to understand not just your customers, but who else in the world is having similar experiences and how can you use that information to make informed decisions about how your business moves forward. We are gearing up for an unprecedented 2021 e-commerce season. E-commerce sales are expected to exceed 2020 benchmarks, even though COVID is lightening up. Consumer behavior has changed forever. And with Quantum Metric, you can prepare yourself to capture every single customer revenue opportunity. So their unique approach to the digital experience that the customer has while engaging with your brand helps top retailers, e-commerce outlets quickly identify and prioritize large and small revenue opportunities. And they keep Keep customers coming back. So everything from page hits, mouse movements, scrolling, typing, out of the box interactions that you couldn't even think of, various events, API calls, literally everything, they quantify that data and they present it to you so that you can use that data to make informed decisions about how customers interact with your brand online. So if you want to reduce customer friction, if you want to increase conversions, drive more revenue, optimize user experience, personalize the shopping experience for all of your customers, go visit quantummetric.com slash pod offer. That's quantummetric.com slash pod offer and go see if you qualify for the 12 days of insights offer using the code success. The 12 days of insight offer gives you 12 days of access to the quantum metric platform with a bespoke insight report that will help you identify where customers are struggling and engaging 
with your online experience and your digital product. Some restrictions apply, but for the majority of people, go to quantummetric.com slash pod offer, enter the code success, and you will be able to receive their 12 days of insights offer. Get ready to understand your customers with intimate detail that can optimize experience and revenue and give your customers an overall much more pleasant experience when they hit your site. All right, let's get back to the show. Number one, be yourself. So there's only one version of you. Don't be a version of somebody else. Don't mock, mimic anyone else. Don't copy anyone else. Literally be yourself. You like neck tattoos? Add neck tattoos. You like arm tattoos? Whatever it is, again, uniqueness is not defined by tattoos. Just be your unique, your unique self. And what yeah. I specifically did is I went out of my way to help people. I have undiagnosed ADD. I love distracting myself from the task at hand sometimes. So I would, I was on this listserv, which is just basically a subscription of, let's say, 10,000 attorneys in California where you send an email, everyone can read it, and you ask a question. I literally, with ADD, would interrupt my day and answer 20 to 30 questions a day. Someone asks a question, they have no idea what to do, it would take them two weeks to figure it out. In two seconds, I've answered it, I've given them a sample, and I've told them they can reach out to me for help. That really made a difference in terms of one, getting my name known to people in terms of just my willingness to help. And then my results distinguished me. So if you get, a, you know, if you score 50 points a night after, you know, a year for 10 games, people are going to know who you are. So it's results. It's commu- letting people know your results and then helping others. Look at every transaction, not as an opportunity to help yourself, but how can you be of service to others? And then it will come back to you how that transaction can help you, maybe on a bigger scale than you ever thought when you initially entered that transaction. But look at things in terms of how can you help people. You know, it's just, it's powerful coming from you in particular, because you have achieved success in what many would be considered, uh, like many would consider trial attorney to be like a highly adversarial, like, don't mess with that guy. He's going he's gonna, to, you know, like when somebody hears that you've taken on all these car companies and all that, you're like, this must be some mean ass mother, you know, like that's, that's the general takeaway perception. So I think that that's, it's an important point. It's, it's a, an important, like pay attention because there's good ways to do business and to be successful. And I think, you know, over the past year and a half, two years, everybody's been stressed out. Everybody's been in that, you said it well, as the miser attitude towards business toward the being frugal furloughing hoarding like just all these things that are so negative but like you're you're living proof man you you don't have to you don't have to live like that yeah. I, I need to work on it too it's tough it's very tough i think another important aspect of my success is surrounding your pe- your yourself with people who are not toxic who are up to big things who bring out the best in you. I mean, one of the best things that ever happened to me, which so many men and women spend their time looking for is that perfect mate. You know, when I was 23, graduating law school, I met my girlfriend who then became my wife. We're divorced now, but we're super close. But I would not have any of the success I have now if it wasn't for her. She really elevated my mindset, believed in me, pushed me, took care of a lot of the stuff that I couldn't handle efficiently so I could work insane hours. So I would tell people, if you're in a bad relationship, friend, lover, family, get out of it and and stay alone and then surround yourself only with people who will push and challenge you, who don't think small. They don't have to be billionaires or successful, but they need to be on the path. And you surround yourself with those people that push you and you push them, you will get a lot further in life than if you are surrounded with negative, toxic, people who are just going to drag you down. So again, one of the most important things was finding that special one person to help me navigate and sort of get way further than I ever thought I would ever get in life. Amazing. Um, I have a couple, I like to go into a couple rapid fire uh, career questions and we've already gone into a lot of really great insight and, and that's amazing because sometimes we just really stick with whatever domain or whatnot, but we brought, we brought it out. I think a lot of this stuff is applicable across the board. Was there anything that we didn't dive into or I didn't think to ask that was more domain specific? Any, any last learnings out of law, taking on corporations, dealing with these types of litigations that you, you just want to close up with? Well, yeah, I mean, just remember, there's always new approaches to doing anything, surgery, painting, music. 
there's always a space for innovation, creativity, and passion. You, you, sometimes you can't, you know, why did this Bozzy song, you know, Your Mind, Three Minute Song, hit it, right? But you listen to it and you go, there's just something about the ingredients of that song that's all high level, it's like food. You know, just stick with basics, good stuff, and you'll be successful. Same in law or any other thing. Start with the best ingredients, look at it like an art form, master it to the point that you can do three ingredients instead of 50 and still kill it and have mm -hmm. people go, wow. Uh, use that approach. Always know their space. You know, if you said to yourself as a guitar player, I'm never going to be as good as Jimi Hendrix. Why should I play guitar? Right? Everyone would quit. But when mm -hmm. you realize there's a space for a punk rock guitar player who doesn't even know what they're doing, but can still create amazing music that speaks to you, even if you're not technically proficient like Jimi Hendrix, that's how you should look at life. There's a space for you to shine in whatever career path you want, whether you have the technical proficiency or not. If you are really good at it, you love what you do, and you're creating something unique in a space that somebody else hasn't created before. Amazing advice. Thank you. Um, okay, let's, let's go into some rapid fire. You've had an amazing career you know, multiple eight figure, seven figure settlements. Um, you've had a lot of challenges. What has been the biggest challenge for you personally or professionally? How'd you I, overcome it? Getting over my ego. You know, you, it's like <laughs> once you start getting successful, then you start believing the hype. You start believing I deserve this. I deserve that. I work hard. I should play hard and realizing that, look, if you've been given a talent and you are successful at it, you can't squander it on personal ego-based events because there are a lot of people that are living that rely on it from your staff to your employees to other consumers. And then there's a lot of people in the future that will be relying on your output and work. So don't squander that talent with stupid stuff. It's really just killing my ego, fighting my ego, not being lazy, really living up to my potential and living not to generate income for my own personal or family or whatever consumption, but generating to help generations of humans. Amazing. Um, who was one person that had an incredible impact on your life and what did they teach you? I mean, it, well, first was my, my, my father, obviously. My father taught me, one, not to be emotional, which was a very sort of a bizarre sociopathic way to live your existence if you're very emotional. Learning how to compartmentalize your emotions allows you to swiftly navigate life without uh, sort of the pushback that you would have if you're a sensitive person. And then if you actually happen to be super sensitive and get up in front of a jury, it's super powerful because you tend to win. Um, so that was kind of like an uh, unintended outcome of my father's anti emotional upbringing. He's now super emotional and very sensitive, so he's evolved, and now we get to share our emotional side together. He also taught me the value of hard work, how no one plans to be, uh, you know, to, to not win, to sort of be uh, unsuccessful, that you have to plan to be successful. It takes hard work, there's no substitute for it. Um, and then my ex-wife kind of just showed me what love and affection can produce, and just being kind and nice, uh, really gets more sugar. You get more with sugar than you do with poison. Uh, you know, those are the two people that had a huge impact on me. Um, what would be one thing that you would tell your 20 year old self? Oh, I would tell my 20 year old self, please develop the DJ gig because believe it or not, for four years, you could make 600,000 a day DJing in the South of France or Vegas and then cash out and then go to law school. <laughs> I saw you're you're you you DJ part time, right? I do, but not the five hundred thousand dollar a gig. Yeah, I was gonna say exist a few years ago. That that was amazing. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I I did I did my my bit in university, and I still enjoy. I still have uh, all my equipment. Okay, <laughs> so, I literally yeah. had DJ equipment around my kids, and was like, please, one of you, please. Let's start. Learn some Lotto or at Ableton. Let's just start DJing. You don't know how yeah. much money there is. Yeah. Um, uh, your favorite source to learn from, or it could be a book, podcast, Audible, anything that you'd recommend people go check out. Sure. Untethered Soul. It's on Amazon. It's under $10 paperback. I read that over and over. It 
takes all of the Eastern, Western, Deepak Chopra, high level human design understanding and puts it into an easy to understand, really beautiful book. You can open up, look at any page. The paragraph will apply currently to your life and give you insight. It's one of the most important books I think everyone should read and reread so that they can uh, successfully navigate this human existence. What does success mean to you? Success means to me, how much of an impact have you made on, in this universe? How much joy, happiness, inspiration have you brought to others? That's success. Amazing. And then most importantly, how do people reach you? Uh, socials, website, all of that. Yeah, I mean, arsh at hamampur.com is my email. Instagram, arsh hamampur, A-R-A-S-H-H-O-M-A-M-P-O-U-R. The Archer DJ is my Instagram handle. Message me. I'm available to talk to anyone, anytime. I'm someone that makes myself available to everyone to help them when I can. Um, you know, it's really important for me to give back and, and help others. I get more out of it than they get from me, believe it or not. Amazing. Thank you. I, I, Arash, I really, really appreciate it.